Oh. Well, good morning. <clears throat> My small group has recently been going through this stu- a study that challenged us to spend more time with God in prayer. And as a result of that, prayer has been on my mind quite a bit lately. Prayer, simply put, is a conversation with God. If we turn prayer into a monologue or use it as a way to showcase our our gift with words or as an opportunity to instruct others who may be listening, we defeat the very purpose of prayer. The Bible makes it clear that prayer is intended as the line of connection from the heart of the praying person directly to the heart of God. Jesus himself practiced the lifestyle of prayer and urged his disciples to imitate him by making it a part of their daily existence. So let's look at what God intends prayer to be. I think the most clear picture of what God intended is to look at the Lord's Prayer as explained to the disciples by Jesus himself. The incredibly powerful first words carry the weight of all prayer. Our Father in heaven. This is a uniquely Christian phrase. In these two words alone, our Father, we recognize two truths, the nearness of God as Heavenly Father and the sovereignty of God as the one who controls everything. As soon as you cry out in prayer, Heavenly Father, you're recognizing his presence in your life. After the Lord's Prayer, and as his conclusion to it, in Luke 11, 13, Jesus told us that God would give the Holy Spirit, his indwelling presence, to those who ask for it. It's not spoken in the form of a question. It ends with an exclamation point. God will give the gift of the indwelling presence of the Holy God to any who ask for it. This is an absolute certainty that you can count on. I absolutely love Romans 8, 26, which says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When I'm spending time in my daily prayer, there are many times where I find myself at a loss for words. And the promise of the Holy Spirit speaking on my behalf, the promise that the jumble in my mind of emotions and struggles, joys and questions, it's all brought to the Father through wordless groans. The paramount need today today for all people is the indwelling presence of God. In this incredible twist, the Holy Spirit makes God both the enabler of our prayers and the provider of the answers of those prayers. So as we prepare for communion today, let's go to our Father in prayer, thanking him for the gift of the cross, seeking forgiveness for our sins, and allowing the Holy Spirit to groan on our behalf. Let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this incredible church for this place that we can call home, for the family and the community that we have here. Thank you for the gift of the cross, for the gift of forgiveness, for the incredible sacrifice that you made that day over 2,000 years ago. God, we pray that we would not take it lightly, but that we would come to this communion table with somber hearts, relieving any bitterness that we have against our fellow brothers and sisters, in coming to you with open hands, ready to accept this gift of grace and forgiveness. Please be with us today. Help us to learn a little more about you, to come a little closer to you, and to grow closer together as a community here in Selkirk. In your name we pray. Amen. When they were gathered together in the room on the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread He broke it and he passed it amongst his disciples saying, eat this in remembrance of my broken body. After they'd eaten the bread, he took the cup And he passed it amongst them likewise, saying, Drink this in remembrance of my shed blood for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. I'm going to lead us with uh, congregational prayer. Thanks, Matt, for setting up uh, the thing on prayer, so I can critique how I do here. Uh, 
We're just going to go through and uh, we'll just pray together and uh, let's just begin. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for this beautiful day that we have. We thank you that uh, we could be here together. Um, thank you for this congregation. And uh, we just ask that you fill us with your, with your spirit. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Psalms 103 and 5 says, It is you who made us and not we ourselves. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. For the Lord is good, your mercy is everlasting, and your truth endures to all generations. We humble ourselves as we come to you with our prayer requests. We ask that you continue to be with Kelly Bill and her family. Continue to heal Kelly and comfort her and the family. We pray for Lauren Smith and her family, as she has recently lost two of her sisters. Please continue to be with her, and especially her parents, as this is an especially difficult time for them as well. We pray for Franny Smuck, as he is currently in the hospital. We ask for your healing hand to come on him. We pray for wisdom and discernment for the doctors and nurses to get him well and able to come home. There are many people who need you in uh, this congregation, Lord. We may not know exactly how to pray for them, but you know all things, and you know what they need. We just ask that you move in our lives, providing healing, comfort, hope, courage to take our next step, wisdom in our decisions. We uh, pray for uh, a successful Dorcas camp, Lord. We just ask that you be with uh, Teresa Salvador and her helpers to glorify you through this camp. Uh, we just ask that you help all who attend draw near to you and have a great time. We thank you for answered prayer. We ask that you are with Dan Horn as he comes to teach us from your word. We ask that you fill him with your words and open our minds and our hearts to your instruction and give us the courage to apply your truth in our lives. We pray all these things before you in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks. Well, good morning. You came back. That's a good sign. And what's the name of that young little darling who was singing up here earlier? Georgia. Georgia? Well, that was adorable. And you can't help but think of that <clears throat> beautiful phrase, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Isn't that beautiful that God would set apart little kids to praise him? And I learned a lot from that expression this morning. I've got to work on this part, though. <laughs> Last week, I used the phrase, in the beginning, and we had half the congregation finished with, was the word and God created. Both were true. Um, but I didn't give you the Ira Shirk version, the ISV. So Ira reads that passage, and I hope we're online so he can hear this this morning. Um, Ira reads the passage, in the big inning, God created baseball. <laughs> um, you know the Pope has been in town, right? So the Pope's over in, uh, in Alberta doing his thing. But the Pope never gets a chance to drive because he's always chauffeured. So this week he kind of whispered into his chauffeur's ear, can we go somewhere really remote that no one will know us or think about us? And can I just drive the limo for the, just, just a little bit of driving? It's kind of experiences. And the chauffeur says, all right, like this is crazy, but we'll go very remote. So he ends up out um, in the country near my dad's. Very remote, no one around. And as he's driving down, my, my dad's out there fiddling around on his lawnmower, and he sees, he sees this moment. The Pope's got like 500 yards of driving because it's very short. And he sees this moment, and, and it's like my dad looks, and he's like, oh, my goodness. So he calls me, and he says, Dan, um, you're not going to believe this. I think I've seen the most important person I've ever seen in my life. I didn't get a good look at him because it was kind of tinted glass, but all I know is this, 
the Pope was his chauffeur. <laughs> I, I, we got to find that guy. <laughs> Just kidding. Just a little bit of, le a little bit of levity. Um, I want to just introduce you to a character today that illustrates our, our sermon. And um, his name is Jesse Owens. And you may have heard of him in 1936. Jesse Owens reaches the zenith of his career. And of course, he's been shining shoes and working all his life. And he's pretty marginalized, but he can run. And like Eric Liddell, the phrase comes to mind, when I run, I feel his pleasure. God set this man apart, gave him a gift, and he worked really hard to make it flourish. And when he was at the pinnacle of his career, Adolf Hitler was at the pinnacle of his in 1936. And of course, the Aryan race was at the highlight of Hitler's world. And if you are anything but blonde hair, blue eyes, and trained in the Nazi regime, you're just something other. Hitler had used a lot of very strong racial tropes against gypsies, Jews, the marginalized, and especially black people. They weren't even considered humane. And Jesse Owens wins four gold medals right in front of him, crushing the closest sprinter. The videos are wonderful to watch. You can see the movie Race, it'll tell you the story. But something incredible happens. And it's happening in Jesus' life all the time. You don't embarrass and shame people on their own turf in front of their own crowd. Adolf's a very proud man. And Jesse embarrasses him in the 100 meter, 200. And then the long jump shows up. They won the relay by a long shot. And then the long jump comes. And this is where the story gets beautiful. This is where the Jesus moment comes in because he meets a young man whose name is Lutz Long. Lutz is the great hope of the Nazi German Olympic team. And Lutz is doing the long jump with Jesse. And they're both outstanding. Jesse never practices the long jump because he finds it a little arduous and he's a sprinter but he's still good at it and his first two jumps are foot faults and now he could win the fourth gold medal but now he's in trouble and Lutz walks up to him they've become friends and says Jesse I'm going to put a little hanky down here and I suggest that you jump about a foot before the takeoff board you're good enough to go farther but if you fault you're done and of course, Jesse, you'll see it on the tape, he takes off way early. Lutz had just jumped and beat the world record. And he encourages Jesse, and Jesse takes off and beats the world record by like a foot. And then arm in arm, this is precious, arm in arm, they walk around the track celebrating. <laughs> You think that's going to make Hitler really, really angry? Yeah. And then there's this gorgeous moment where the anthems are playing and Jesse has got his hand on his heart. Lutz is beside him. And they became friends. Lutz paid a really big price for loving Jesse Owens. He was sent in World War II a few months later to the front lines and he was killed in battle, an Olympic champion was killed in battle and Jesse came home lived a godly life and mentored young men in our story today thanks gents <clears throat> in Luke chapter 7 you can look it up in Luke chapter 7 like last week Jesus embarrasses the power people the people in control he embarrasses them on their own turf like Jesse and Luke Lutz did on Hitler's turf and the story goes like this. You've heard it before. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, Luke 7, 36. And Jesus reclined at the table. Now, there was a woman in the city who was known as a sinner. And when she found out, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, so hang in with me. When she found out that he was eating, reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, 
she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, crying her eyes out, she began wetting his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and respectfully kissed his feet, an act signifying affection and submission, and he anointed them with the perfume. And Simon, in great disdain, looks down and says, if this man were a prophet, surely he would know what this woman stood for. That's how it sets up. But because it's kind of the summer, and I'm in my little summer camp vibe mode, I'm usually talking to grade six to eight kids at summer camp, we're going to have a little summer camp moment, because I want you to feel this scene. So I need some Pharisees, some kind of religious types. So uh, I need four volunteers, some guys. I've poked a few people. Get up here, Paul. Get up here. You got to get volunteers at camp. Yeah, come on up here. I need a few people. I need a few Pharisees, a few religious types, a few people staring at their Bible right now. You got a minute? You'd be perfect. Get up here. Perfect. <laughs> so when the Bible says they were reclining at the table, Simon has this party. Yeah, they brought their cell phones. They had their technology. It was off. <laughs> and what would happen is you'd have the normal milling around, and then everybody would recline on their left elbow. So, gents, you're going to recline on the left elbow, and you're going to be in a circle. You look like a bunch of seals in a freaking beach. Were you, for heaven's sakes, that's good. <laughs> All right, good. All right. Now, in Middle Eastern fellowship, it's left elbow. Did I say left or right? It's on the left elbow. It's on the left elbow. Now, of course, these guys are still caught up in the COVID mess, so they're social distancing. But in, in Palestine, they're really close, all right? <laughs> Beautiful. This is great. All right, now where's Jesus? Mark, get up. We need a Jesus. Mark. For, for, the, for heaven's sakes, Mark, get up here. So we need Jesus, right? What happens is I'll be Simon when Jesus... Jesus puts his hands up. Oh, for the love of God, buddy. It's, <laughs> don't be doing the Nazi thing. Just oh, yeah. work with it. All right. All right. So Jesus shows up. What normally... Yes, this is what normally happens. You put your hand on his shoulder. Yes. Mark never did social distance, so this is perfect. And you kiss, right? You, that's what you do. Or if you're a little humbler, Judas, remember Judas did this? You, you kiss the hand. At the doorway of every house is a doulos. A doulos. The doulos has a basin. We doing okay over there, guys? <laughs> You just, hey, just because you're Pharisees, you pay attention, okay? The doulos would have a bowl of water. And he would take the sandals off, put them in the water, put the feet in the water and wash them. Isn't it interesting that John says, I'm not even worthy to take the strap of the sandal off. What John is saying in that moment, John the Baptist I can't even wash his feet. Like the, 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 the galley slave is the lowest of the slaves. So Simon doesn't do that. Simon doesn't kiss him. Simon doesn't even welcome him. He wants Jesus to come in and he's trying to trap him and just investigate him and see, well, are you who you say you are, the prophet, the Messiah? Many people come to a place of worship to analyze Jesus. I would suggest to you, come to the place of worship so he can analyze you and me and tell us what we need to do. Jesus comes in, and the first thing he does, just before the guys are milling around, you're supposed to sit down like the British aristocracy in order of your rank, your position. In ancient Palestine, you sit down according to your age. <laughs> who's, the old, who's the oldest here? Do we know? Paul... <laughs> So they're all pointing to the church here. Okay, so you're there. So oldest would sit down first. When Jesus comes in and says he reclined at the table, Jesus walks right by Simon with all his arrogance and pride, and he reclines. 
So boom. Boom. Jesus is reclining with the boys. Right here. Mark, you're beautiful. Got the, he's got the right elbow? Okay, don't, don't, don't get too comfortable, Mark. Gee. Recline right there. All right, perfect. Now we need a woman with a really bad reputation in town, so I've asked Peggy to help me out here. Because <laughs> I knew she would be able to manage it, right? I'm not washing anyone's I know, I know. It's not, you don't get to wash the feet. Your hair's not long enough anyways. So she would come in, the hair would be covered tight because you don't show, you'd be completely covered, so perfect, modest dress for a good Christian lady. So she comes in. We know from the story that she has a little flask, she has a jar, and it's an alabaster jar, and in the alabaster jar would be a very, very expensive perfume. Now why would the Bible just use that little detail, alabaster? Number one, it wants you to know the perfume's expensive. Number two, it sounds like a true account of an actual story that happened. So she walks in, and Jesus has been teaching. And Mark, what's Jesus always teaching? You do open me up. Mark, you're Jesus. You've got to be lasered in. What does he teach? Prayer. Prayer. What is he came to seek and save the lost? And what does Jesus do mainly about sin? forgives. Jesus has been telling the whole town, I forgive sin. And Simon sees this woman come in. And some of you might be wondering when you read the text, how did she, does she just kind of walk in on them? Is she invited? Is the guy at the front door looking at the alabaster flask and saying, well, she's got a nice present, she can come in. In ancient Palestine, when you had meals, the guys would all be reclined. It would be in a courtyard. Sometimes it was outside. So it was very interesting how people who were poor and didn't have a lot of money, as we know, Lazarus picked up the crumbs from under the table. There's dogs around. Sometimes it's just an open place and people show up. And when the woman shows up, she sees Jesus and she knows that she's been forgiven. A lot of commentators get this wrong. They say when the woman came up and had a conversation with Jesus, he forgave her. What actually happened, Jesus was preaching all week, and this woman said, please, where is he? I want to find Jesus. I want to interact with him, and I want to say thank you. Her heart is completely given to saying, Jesus, if you can forgive me, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's one of the most important ways to walk with Jesus, thanksgiving. Jesus takes a loaf of bread, breaks it in half, and says, thank you, Father, and 20,000 people get fed. He stands at the tomb of Lazarus, and when he prays, and we're talking about prayer this morning, he says, thank you that you always hear me, and a guy who was dead for three days comes out of the tomb. Walk with Jesus in a spirit of continual thankfulness. The Bible says we should be overflowing with thankfulness. That's the posture of the woman. But she's also a little nervous because all these guys are in the intellectual elite. They're the power brokers. They got lots of money. And she walks in and she sees Jesus and then overwhelmed by his love, she just starts to cry. That's the story. Can you thank our actors, please? I won't make you do it. <laughs> Okay, when I come back, we're going to part the Red Sea, and you're going to be Roman soldiers, sorry, Egyptian soldiers, so get ready. And I'm going to get the hose out. I'm just kidding. She takes a look at Jesus. Women, in the, women weren't, um, weren't even considered a major part of the societal structure. Number one, if you were a woman, you would not be educated. You don't get to go to school. You cannot witness to anything, crimes, Anything going on, you're not a witness. A woman is very low in the social structure. And isn't it interesting that this woman shows up because Jesus taught her. Mary falls at the feet of Jesus and says, uh, takes on the posture of a um, disciple, I want him to teach me. Jesus always elevates everyone. He elevates all races, all peoples, all sexes. There is no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no, no um, free, no man or woman in the kingdom. He just brings them all in. So this woman knows, he teaches, 
He's taught me about forgiveness. I want to be with Jesus. So she comes in. She has a reputation. Some commentators say she was a prostitute. It doesn't specifically say, but her reputation was well known. In verse 39, when Simon the Pharisee invited him in, he said, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this sort of woman is who is touching him. Rabbis were not allowed to talk to women in public. Rabbis weren't allowed to talk to their wife in public. That's the reason for divorce. Uh, rabbis weren't allowed to, women weren't allowed to touch men. There's all these rules, and Jesus just trashes them all because it's Emmanuel. God is with us. Jesus is coming in to show people a new way to love God and love people, and Simon has the opportunity to see it, and he misses it. Because all he's doing is analyzing Jesus. It's the analysis that causes paralysis. You see people just strain at trying to figure out who Jesus is instead of enjoying his love and forgiveness. This woman's got it right. Uneducated, simple, not part of the power structure of the day. And then Jesus looks at Simon, knows what he's thinking, and in verse 40, Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And what he says when he says, I have something to say to you, this is a, an Aramaic term that's, you might not like what I have to say to you. And Jesus goes to kindergarten theology 101 and says, Simon, after Simon says, go ahead, say it, a certain money lender had two debtors, one owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. A denarii is one day's wages. So one owed him 50 days work wages, the other owed him 500 wages. And when they both had no means of repaying, he freely forgave both of them. Simon, which one would have loved and appreciated that debt cancellation more? It sounds like kindergarten theology. Simon says, well, I, I, I suppose, if he's wondering if Jesus is trying to trick him, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said, you have stated correctly. What's interesting, though, is in the Old Testament, what Simon had memorized, God is always the creditor. God has everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God is always the owner and possessor of all things. And you and I are the debtors. Jesus puts himself very subtly in the parable in the position of God, which you don't do unless you're God himself. And then Simon is very curious. And Jesus, in verse 44, this is the little TSN turning point. This is a beautiful part of the passage. Listen to this. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon. He's looking at the woman, and he's talking to Simon. Turning towards the woman, he said, do you see this woman, Simon? Love that phrase. Do you see? Notice the marginalized and the hurting always run to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the religious people, the legalists, they don't even see them. I made one of the stupidest mistakes of my life. I was at a mission conference years ago with some friends, and I was happy to see them. They were from British Columbia, and I said, oh, I want to go eat at the Grand Marche. I was thinking, can you imagine? I'm thinking of my stomach at a missions conference. And I'm like, I want to go eat at the Grand Marche. So I said, let's, let's go. We're in downtown Toronto. We've got 45 minutes. I know where it is, but it's a mile, kilometer. Let's, so we're running. As I'm running part of the missions conference. I'm running under the bridges in Toronto and there's homeless people all down there. I'm not even looking. And then I go to the Grand Marche and my appetite was gone. I thought, Ugh, just go back to the conference. How often do people sitting on a street corner, I've been to India, I've been to some of the toughest cities. My dad took us to Tijuana, Mexico when we were young and you kind of avoid the eye contact, right? Do you see this woman, Simon? People on the margins always run to Jesus. Question for me, question for you. Do people on the margins run to you? 
in me? Do they want to be in our presence? Is there something about you and me that makes the people who are really hurting and desperate come around and say, wow, I want to be with you. It's a great thing to think. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You didn't extend me any of the courtesies. No water for the feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears. This woman is so overwhelmed with the forgiveness of Jesus, she just starts to cry. And the water that was supposed to be at the front door, she provides that. She doesn't provide basic olive oil, and olive oil was the soap of the day, which she would just wash her hands with. No, no, she pours expensive perfume. The word used for when she bowed down is proscunine. When you prostrate, when you prostrate, when you fall on your face, um, it's a good principle to practice. Every so often now I will roll out of the bed first thing in the morning and I will just get down low on my face and just let the Lord know how thankful I am for eyes that see and ears that hear and hands that and just get low because he's big. She comes to worship, they come to party and to analyze Jesus. She comes to bring her gifts of love and sacrifice. They come just to get another free meal and then she lets the hair down. That is equivalent in ancient Palestine. Excuse the harshness of the illustration, but it would be looked at as just taking your shirt off. You don't let your hair down. When a woman gets married, the hair goes up, and the only time it ever comes down is when she's with her husband. It's a very strict rule. And of course, they got rules upon the rules. Don't touch, don't taste and Jesus says, I'm making all things new. And this woman lets her hair down. And the word is a passionate respect. It is beautiful. It's not erotic at all. And she wipes the tears with her hair. She should have brought a towel and a basin of water. But she would have expected Simon to do that. So she provides in the instant what Jesus needs. You didn't provide water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears. And wiped. you gave me no welcoming kiss. You would kiss on the hand, the cheek, or the head. But from the moment I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet respectfully, gently. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and conspire against the Lord and his anointed one? Psalm 2 says, kiss the son. She knows who Jesus is. She knows she's in the presence of God himself. And the Bible's main two commands are love God and love your neighbor. Simon has the opportunity to love God who's in his presence and love his neighbor. But he's so blind by his pride, he says, this woman is not included in the forgiveness of God. And there's no way this man represents God because he loves her. And Jesus completely turns this whole social paradigm and religious paradigm upside down. You didn't anoint my head with ordinary oil. She's anointed it with costly, pure perfume. Therefore, I say to you, isn't this great? <laughs> I say to you, Simon, arrogant, proud Pharisee, her sins are forgiven because they were many. But he was forgiven little, in parentheses, Simon loves little. Do you know how much you've been forgiven from today? Do you know how much God has rescued you from? It's a beautiful thing to ponder. And then he looks at her. Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, speaks the word and Mount Everest comes into being and he looks at this woman who has been marginalized and broken and says, your sins are forgiven. And those who are reclining at the table begin saying, who is this who forgives sins? And then Jesus says to the woman, your faith in me has saved you. Go in peace. You are free. There's a songwriter named Nicole Nordman. She's quite brilliant. She wrote a song a few years ago. It goes like this and makes me think of how we look at people and how we consider them when we leave here today and what they are like. When I met him on a sidewalk, he was preaching to a mailbox down on 16th Avenue. He told me he was Jesus sent from Jupiter to free us with a bottle of tequila in one shoe. 
He raged about repentance. He finished every sentence with a promise that the end was close at hand. I didn't even try to understand. He left me wide-eyed in disbelief, disillusioned. I was tongue-tied, drawn by my conclusions. So I just turned and walked away, laughed at what he had to say, then casually dismissed him as a fraud. I forgot he was created in the image of my God. When I met her at a bookstore, she was browsing on the first floor in the yoga magazines. She told me in her past life she was some plantation slave's wife and had to figure out what this might mean. She believes the healing powers of her crystals will bring balance and purpose to her life. Sounds nice. She left me wide-eyed in disbelief and disillusion, tongue-tied, drawn by my conclusions, and I just turned and walked away and casually dismissed her as a fraud. I forgot I was looking, someone created in the image of my God. Not so long ago, a man from Galilee fed thousands with his bread and his theology. And the truth he spoke quickly became the joke of educated, self-inflated Pharisees like me. And they were wide-eyed in disbelief and disillusioned. They were tongue-tied, drawn by their conclusions. Would I have turned? and walked away and laughed at what he had to say and casually dismissed him as a fraud, unaware that I was looking at the image of my God. Simon has a visit from Jesus, God himself, and a woman who Jesus loves enters the room. You and I are going to leave here today And we will have encounters this week with Emmanuel, God with us. And he might show up in the person of someone who you really don't want to be around. Forgiveness in the ancient world was earned and merited by your behavior, by your sacrifices, and by determining never to do it again. When this woman showed up to Simon's house, even if she would have asked, can I be forgiven? They would have said, there's no way you can be reconciled to all those people you've sinned against sexually, and there's no way you can change your life. Thank you, but forgiveness is not offered to someone like you because it had to be earned. Jesus comes into the world to say everyone gets a chance to receive the forgiveness of God, and you have that message. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa decided to do something very revolutionary a number of years ago. Bishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela knew the problem of hatred, division, in apartheid South Africa was so bad, it had gone so far, we can't prosecute everybody. So we will decide to have a tribunal, and whoever stands in front of the court and says, What they did admits it. We will let them free on the promise that they will live a new life. And Officer Van Brock stands in front of the tribunal and gives his statement about burning this wonderful woman's son and killing him and murdering her husband. And he admits it. Racial prejudice, hatred, he murdered the dad and the son over the course of a year, and the victim of this horrific crime gets to give an impact statement, while this guy gets to live a new life in freedom. And she sat there and looked him in the eye, and she said, this man has taken everything away from me that's been meaningful. But I still have a lot of love to give. So I would like him to come over to my place once a month and I will feed him and love him because that's what the gospel of reconciliation means. Spontaneously in that courtroom, everybody erupted into the song Amazing Grace. And Officer Van Brock did not hear it because he passed out in shock. True story. 
the amazing grace of Jesus is almost an offensive assault on the hatred and the bitterness and the cruelty of our times. We have good news for people. You can be forgiven by a God who is pure grace and all you have to do is say thank you like this broken woman. Isn't that great? We have good news. Let's bring that to the world. Turn off CNN and Fox and your podcast for a little bit. Get into the good news, not the fake news, <laughs> and tell people that Jesus is here to seek and to save them. Father, we thank you again for another episode in your wonderful life. Thank you for revealing your character so clearly in the person of Jesus, and we would like to embrace Jesus today like this woman. In our hearts, we would like to fall down at your feet and say thank you. We would like to bring our expensive gifts of time, talent, and treasure and offer them to you. And we thank you that you take our meager little gifts, multiply them, and bless and feed a hurting world. Use us today, Lord, to fulfill the kingdom mandate to seek and to save the lost. We thank you that you dwell in our hearts so we can do this with great joy. And we ask that you would receive glory from our lives this week. Thank you. Amen. Please stand as we close.
Let's close with a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for today, for this, uh, this time where we can worship you, for this great message that Dan was able to bring from your word. Um, God, I pray that we would not just look past people, Lord, but that we would see you in all of these incredible people you've given to us in our lives, whether they be a stranger on the street, a good friend or a family member or a co-worker, um, or the guy that just drives us insane. God, we know that you are you are with them all, that they are all in your image, and Lord, we pray that we would treat them as such and that we would work um, for your good, that we would work with your plans and that we would seek out your ways in this earth, Lord, and we would um, we would serve you as we as we walk through our daily lives. In your name, we pray. Amen. Have a great week.